So, um, hello and welcome to our book presentation today, which is part of this year's virtual European Social Science History Conference. Um, just as a heads up, this Zoom talk will be recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and this will go as follows. So we'll have a short introduction by me of the editors and authors um, who will then tell you um, about the book, how it came to be, um, what, apart from the obvious and very annoyingly still topical theme of COVID, it is about specifically and also the motivation behind publishing it. Um, afterwards, uh, there will be time for questions uh, in a short Q&A session um, or a discussion. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to post those into the chat during the whole time or raise your hands um, afterwards and I will unmute you so you can talk. So to uh, talk uh, about today's presentation and um, it's about the book Corona and Work Around the Globe it was published in the book series Work in Global and Historical Perspective, a book series that's edited by Andreas Eckert, Mahua Saka, Sidney Shalou, Dimitri van Bersela and Christian G. De Vito. One brief sentence about the series, if you're interested, I can also post a link into the chat later on. Um, the book series uh, mainly addresses the history of commodified labor and investigates its many forms on a global scale. Uh, and it attempts to look beyond both locality and region toward wider spatial relationships. So the 11th volume, Corona and Work Around the Globe, um, provides a global perspective on the transformations in the world of work caused by um, COVID-19, the global pandemic we're all living in. Today's speakers are uh, the two book editors, Felicitas Henschke and Andreas Eckert, as well as two of the uh, contributors, Bridget Kenny and Braben Kasum. And I will shortly introduce them now before then finally shutting up and letting them talk, which is much more interesting. And I'll start um, in the order they'll, they'll talk. So um, first up is uh, Andreas Eckert, uh, who is a professor of African history at Humboldt University to Berlin. Uh, and since 2009, he has also served um, as the director of the International Research Center Work and Human Life Cycle in Global History, aka Rework, um, at Humboldt University Berlin. He has widely published on 19th and 20th century African history, colonialism, labor, global history, and he's currently the director of the Forum for Transregional Studies. Melissa Henschke is a historian and has been the academic coordinator um, at Rework uh, since 2009. In terms of scholarly work, she has pursued projects such as on hostels, hostel dwellers, uh, and labor in global history, on the role of photography and art in the field of history, and uh, also produced exhibitions on Rework topics. Both uh, Andreas and Felicitas are currently also editing Seth Rockman's book called Slavery's Old and New Materialisms, which will be published in a couple of months, hopefully. Um, the contributors um, are Bridget Kenny, who is an associate professor in the sociology department at the University of the uh, Witwatersrand. She works on gender, race, and labor in service work and precarious employment in South Africa. Uh, Bridge is also on the editorial board of various journals and was a research fellow at Rework in 2018. Prem Kasum is a professor of global studies at Roskilde University and a former Rework fellow, also I think in the years 2017, 2018. Um, and his research interests uh, focus on the development of forms of free and unfree labor in the Indian Ocean from the 18th century to the present. Uh, and that's as far as introduction goes. So now I'll hand over to uh, Andreas, who will start uh, introducing the book. All right. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, thank you all for, for joining. Um, so we try to be, in fact, very brief uh, so that there will be enough time within the short hour to have also something like a conversation as uh, far as it is possible in this format. I'm still having difficulties to get used to. 
Uh, so let me very briefly explain what is behind the book or how the idea of this book came up. I mean, the fact that Corona and work are closely linked seems very obvious and became very obvious uh, soon or right from the beginning of the pandemic. And um, the, 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 the core idea of this book came up in a conversation I had with an historian friend in Princeton, Jeremy Edelman. And of course, we talked as we did that time and continue to do so over the way Corona has shaped our lives, but also how Corona shaped uh, or had effects more generally. And um, I told him, for instance, that all our events had been canceled, that no fellow could arrive, that some fellows had to leave. Uh, and then he asked or, or suggested, look, I mean, you have all this network of fellows who are sitting all over the world. So just ask them to write something or ask some of them uh, uh, to write something about Corona and how Corona affected uh, the world of labors in their immediate environment. So I think two days later, we started to contact uh, fellows and uh, what is rather unusual, we asked them to write an essay or something within two months, which is for a book project given the busy times we all have, and especially during a period when most teaching went uh, to remote teaching, uh, a rather demanding task, but to our great surprise, uh, everyone obeyed and delivered in time, which is, I think, a rather unusual story in the world of bookmaking and making of collective uh, volumes. Um, so, and, and we asked them um, to write an essay on how the coronavirus had changed work and labor in particular neighborhoods, cities, regions, or even, even nat nations or states. And um, this was the kind of main outline. And then we asked them more specifically, for example, to what extent um, disruptions and intensifications had instituted changes for the better, or as we assumed, mostly for the worse. Uh, and also if changing features of labor um, changed or were related to uh, the cityscape, welfare politics, uh, the awareness of the strengths of failures of government, the democratic order. And so we ended uh, with a huge array of themes uh, and also regions. So I think we covered more or less uh, all continents. Uh, and um, we did not specify the format. So People could just write a report, a source-based analysis, a reflective essays. Uh, and in, if you read the book uh, or happen to read it, uh, uh, you will see that, that uh, this is also, I think, a very interesting point of the book, that we have this kind of very different approaches uh, to Corona. But what was important for us was that all essays are based on personal experiences of the authors their specific concerns in these times, how they see or saw at this time uh, uh, the changes induced or transformations induced uh, by the pandemic. And so it was for us very important that we uh, asked the authors to focus on the regions they were living in, where they witnessed the transformations and the pandemic. So what we try to avoid, because this is also a genre that is quite popular these days, is to avoid grandiose diagnosis of, this, of the era. Uh, I mean, most uh, of these diagnoses have been outdated probably the day after they have been written. Uh, so we more or less uh, tried uh, to um, have a book full of snapshots uh, with authors looking at things as closely as possible uh, with their camera, so to speak. Uh, and um, we thought that this mix of empirical social research and the kind of reportage would be the best way to capture uh, uh, the corona transformations at a time. And as I said, it's a snapshot. Uh, and uh, the authors or the contributors, the two who are with, with us here, will also try to say a few words how things have changed uh, from their perspective since they wrote the essay. But before they do so, Fehenschke will explain why this book appears somewhat like a coffee table book, which is nicely made uh, with many photographs. Uh, and now you will find out why. 
Thank you, Andreas. Before I start with this, I want to mention something nobody has mentioned uh, so far, that this book is uh, financed, funded by the Berlin Center for Global Engagement, an initiative of the Berlin University Alliance, and they really funded us generously. And without that help, it would not have been um, done, could not have been done. And also um, Tobias Berger, a colleague from Free University, who, couldn't, who can't be here today, um, but uh, he gave a lot of impact to this uh, book too. And uh, now the coffee table book. <laughs> um, this volume has a strong visual component. And in this regard, we followed the example of another volume in this book series. It's called To Be at Home, Housework and Self in the Modern World. And uh, yes, no, not yet. Now you can see it. Uh, this book examines to what extent houses and homes can open new perspectives on the cultural and social meaning of work, labor, and life course. It is added together with James Williams and written like this new book by many WeWork fellows. But I have to add that it took us a much more time <laughs> and to do it. Um, the whole book was not planned in the first place, only after we have failed to transfer an exhibition on a related topic on um, workers' hostels in South Africa from Johannesburg to Berlin. And then with this negative experience, uh, uh, we decided to include our own exhibition in our own book. And that made us to reflect upon this format. So what did we do? We tried to provoke conversations between the books written and the visual parts by using photographs from the archive of the Berlin photographer, uh, Maurice Weiss. His, so in the, the, you can see one of his books uh, from his uh, pictures on the cover of this um, To Be At Home book. Um, so uh, his contributions were not simply illustrating the ethnographic and historical essays and the analysis, but offering another way of looking at the topic, at uh, seeing the world. So photographs in that volume, as well as in, um, now I turn to this book, in Corona and Work Around the Globe, glimpse at dynamics between various forms of political power and people, and here specifically in failure in the face of the pandemic. Uh, on this basis, this book now includes two visual contributions. Maurice Weiss again accompanied a medical team in an emergency ward for coronavirus patients at a hospital in Potsdam in spring 2020. His photo series Black Ward, in German Die Schwarze Station, first published in the German political magazine Der Spiegel. Um, here are now two um, pictures uh, from the book as examples. Uh, depicts people's pressures, stress, and helplessness in the face of the coronavirus about we knew very little at that time. And we were very much impressed by the strengths of these photographs showing the vulnerability of people in the face of all technologies, the sterile uh, coldness of the clinic and the helpers who could hardly be seen behind their masks. So we wanted to have this story being told in the context of this volume. Another series was contributed by Ellen Rosenberg. She is uh, a concept artist and feminist political activist from Chicago and of course a WeWork fellow. And when she told us on Zoom, of course, about her latest interest last year in the entanglement of 
racism and discrimination in the US and public elections, which were enforced under pressure from the Trump administration against all protective measures against Corona. I think all of you remember this. It was uh, discussed and in the media worldwide. So we found this topic important and we decided to include this story in the book too. Unlike Maurice's contribution, she did a collage entitled this is ridiculous voting as labor during COVID-19. And on the title of our book, you can see an excerpt from this uh, uh, work. It is not uh, an edition of pictures, a series of pictures, but it is more like a, a, um, a work you have to understand in, uh, with all, piece, all pictures and collage uh, together. Um, Alan symmetrized the primary elections in two um, federal states in the US, which also took place in spring 2020, and demonstrated the effort and cost of exercising the right to vote under coronavirus conditions. So this work clearly transmits the message of inequality in the US which emerged more strongly than ever during the coronavirus crisis, and which is also true for many other places in the world, which you can also see in the essays of this book, many essays of the book. To contextualize these two visual contributions, they come along with only a title. Uh, we added interviews with Maurice and Alan to give them room to explain and reflect upon their approaches. So generally, and this is my last sentence, we strongly believe that photography has the potential to conceptualize a relationship between work and life course in general, but here in this case, the context of the pandemic very well. It has the potential to reveal the simultaneity of aspects in this global historical moment between order and disorder, humanity and inhumanity, and fear of the future. Thank you. Okay, now we should uh, invite uh, the two or two of the many contributors to this volume. Um, and the first uh, will be Bridget, uh, uh, who speaks about South Africa and more specifically also about Johannesburg. Great, thanks everyone. And thanks for coming. I see there's lots of other contributors in the audience and many others who I know. So hello and thank you. And nice to sort of see you, not really see you. Um, my, my chapter um, for the book is entitled Coronavi Coronavirus Conjunctures, Waged Work, uh, Wagelessness and Futures in South Africa. And what I do in the short piece is I try to set, and I should just, I wanted to say first that it was, I was one of those people who responded almost immediately to the request because it suddenly, you know, despite our chaos and everything we were doing, because I, I it, it suddenly kind of captured a moment where I felt like I needed this. I needed to write about this. I needed to kind of try to make sense of this in a way that wasn't in the immediate, you know, and, I, and it really offered me a, a space to stop and think, um, and I think it was very useful for me for that reason. Um, but I, I first try to contextualize the experience of lockdown in South Africa. So we locked down in um, March, uh, on March 27th of 2020, and we went into a fairly harsh lockdown. Um, you were not allowed to leave your property, basically, except for to do, you know, grocery shopping and if you needed to buy, you know, pharmaceutical, you know, you know, whatever, medicines or whatever. Um, and of course, that immediately meant that experience of lockdown was already informed by the deep inequalities in South Africa. Um, you know, the middle class who lived in, live in big houses with big yards, you know, were troubled, but, you know, could, could cope. 
and you know working class um, you know and poor South Africans who might live for instance in a shack in an informal settlement were obviously lockdown conditions were were you know nearly impossible um, so 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 this happened and it happened at a moment of already declining economic conditions right we were already by the first quarter of 2020 we had already entered recessionary conditions our unemployment rate had already increased it was 30.1 percent um, in the narrow definition of unemployment which includes only people who are looking within six months um, and uh, um, and you know so it really kind of clamped down at a moment when things were already um, deeply uh, troubled um, police, um, you know, and I'm, I'm mentioning this now to come back to it later, um, police uh, uh, patrolled particularly working class townships to enforce lockdown measures. Um, this, you know, was fairly harsh as well. Um, we now know um, through complaints raised at the Independent Police in Investigative Directorate that there are some, you know, uh, 376 um, alleged allegations of police brutality, um, including 10 deaths just related to um, uh, enforcement of lockdown within the first 40 days of lockdown. Um, at, in that period of the first couple of months, 3 million jobs were lost. Um, it, and these were disproportionately affecting, this disproportionately affected black South Africans and particularly women. Um, there's, there was also, you know, dramatic rise in hunger and households reporting hunger. So this is the kind of context. And then in that context, um, I look at two things, or really. I look at um, uh, uh, the experience of service workers, um, you know, I work on retail workers, but also care workers, um, you know, uh, um, domestic workers, you know, all the sort of categories of workers that suddenly we became that became visible in this category of essential workers and everybody who were required to continue to labor to keep the economy going. And so when we opened to sort of level three, these workers were then out um, and operating and having, you know, uh, having to take what's called public transport, but actually it's private transport, you know, and um, crowded um, uh, uh, buses and vans um, and and service um, service people. Unions reported, you know, real problems with having PPEs. Um, nurses and doctors record, re, you know, reported understaffing and you know, um, you know, real um, you know conditions of uh, intensification and of course also problems with PPEs. You know, the sort of deep intensity of that. Um, of those experience for those workers who then had to keep working. Many of many working class workers, of course, had to work because there these were the fewer jobs because of retrenchments um, and increasing unemployment. So there was greater pressure on them to, um, to continue to contribute to households. Um, and then the second thing I sort of look at is the experience, this notion of futures and the experience of young people. My daughter was going through what's called matric in South Africa, the last year of high school. She's, you know, middle class. She, she went to a, you know, a privileged school and the levels of anxiety to cope with this year that is the kind of end of their entire school year, which results, you know, which ends with national exams that are, you know, you know, sort of life defining was deeply anxiety. But of course, for working class kids, it was even more um, difficult with on, online happening, not happening at all, you know, schools going back and not. And I link this to my own students um, and, my, and trying to teach online. And in our context, um, you know, again, online doesn't really mean online, where our students can't necessarily get access very easily, both because of internet access, but also because of things like electricity outages constantly, both planned and unplanned electricity outages. Um, you know, bandwidth is very low here, data costs are very high. So our students are, you know, we're struggling. And I, and I used actually a third year student who I was teaching at the time who did this beautiful analysis and I used it with her permission in a photograph. Um, that she took for, for an essay for me with her permission, you know, that, that poses her looking down onto the street from her now private, re, private student residence, which she's able to pay because she gets, um, you know, student funding from the state to pay to access this. She couldn't yet go onto campus, but she could go back to the private residence. And she's looking at two workers in the streets. One, um, uh, you know, a, a, um, a street cleaner or a, um, a municipal worker, a, a, um, a sanitation worker, I guess it would be called elsewhere. And, you know, with a, with a guy running past her to get to work. And, you know, basically level three meant that these were the workers who entered, um, who had to enter the public space again to engage um, you know, in the conditions. But of course, our level three happened as 
our peak was escalating. It wasn't going down, it was increasing. And so the health risks um, you know, were exacerbated. Um, and you know, I sort of posed this question of the futures of young people facing these difficulties, but in the context for South Africa, of you know this, it was a crisis. It was an exacerbation. But in fact, what we saw was the the exacerbation of what of, of the already deep unequal conditions that exist in South Africa. And that's you know that's really the sort of point of the essay is that we have this crisis moment, but but actually it was more of the same. It just intensified in a way. Um, and I mean, there weren't a lot of positive things. I talk a little bit about food networks and organizing around food and hunger and distribution, which did have a moment when we were all excited about it. Um, a lot of that has closed down since then. Um, in the current moment, we have, you know, so our, um, we, we had, we kind of went to level one around December, and then we saw um, our second wave increasing, you know, to, to beginning to be peak in December, January, and early February. Um, and and it, you would, may know that, uh, um, you know, so this was summer for us and people going on holiday and vacation. And you would know that, um, you know, later on, we sort of also figured out that it corresponded with this new variant, it would call it sometimes called the South African variant because scientists identified it here. And so this variant was, you know, more transmissible, potentially, um, you know, resistant to existing vaccines. And that has really, you know, that really, our, so our second peak was actually higher than our, our first peak. We've come out of it, but already we're beginning um, the, the increase of, our, of what they uh, think to be a third peak. Um, and you know we it's very difficult for us to um, to close down again because of the economy. We went to, through another round of austerity budgets in February, um, and and what that has meant is an across the board twenty percent cut, which has um, particularly impacted um, for me higher education. So now we're seeing another round where this is the beginning of our academic year. We're seeing another round of you know student protests because of. Um, you know, uh, increasing student debt. And in order to register for the new year, they have to pay off the old year, but there's now been cuts to student funding. Um, you know, this has gotten so bad that um, this, the already securitized campus that was partly a response to the previous moment of student protests, you may remember in 2015, 2016 with Fees Must Fall, um, pushes student protests out onto the streets. What's happened recently is then public order policing, which has now been increasingly militarized over the last few years, um, actually in chasing the students shot and killed um, a bystander, Mtuko Zisi Mtumba, who was shot and killed. Um, and that erupted campuses even further. So we're in this situation where we are meant to continue to teach online. Our students don't have really a lot of problems with access still. Um, you know, the austerity cuts across the board um, have impacted, um, you know, many, many sectors. Unemployment has increased even further. By the end of 2020, it was up to 32.5%. Um, and it and it's you know it's a really grim situation. I, I'll end with one last comment, and that's um, about our vaccines. We um, have only really gotten the first vaccines um, uh, in mid February. It's been about a month. We've only managed to vaccinate less than two hundred thousand people. Those are still frontline healthcare workers. So about zero point three percent of the population. Um, and the main issue is that we haven't been able to purchase enough vaccines. South Africa is part of COVAX, the World Health Organization's COVAX, to try and to collectively buy it. And of course, you may know that South Africa and India and a number of global southern countries, um, you know, have put in request for for a waiver of the um, uh, uh, of the private property. Um, uh, um, restrictions on, on, uh, on at the WTO for, for COVID vaccines, but they've been blocked by, you know, various European countries, US, Canada, Australia, Japan, etc. So we're in a situation where it, economically it's very intense. Um, you know, we also have some political issues of division, deep divisions within the ruling party. Um, and, and, you know, we don't, we're, it doesn't look like we're going to get vaccines really to the, to the population, you know, for until really the end of the year at best. So it, it, it I mean, it feels like what I described, you know, whenever it was in August or mid last year it is, has intensified, has somehow gotten worse. I think people are really worn out. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to see a kind of silver lining where we are. 
Um, there is, you know, some organization around some of the issues. We're starting to uh, connect issues around austerity specifically, and you know, uh, um, and think through broader campaigns around that. But uh, it's a grim, it's a grim situation now in South Africa, I think. I'll okay, thank you very much for this. Uh, yes, uh, rather depressing picture, but I'm afraid very realistic picture. Uh, do things look better in Denmark and in Northern Europe, Raven? Thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm very happy to be part of this also. And, and I think the book has been a great project and a very important uh, project because, I mean, one thing that's been really difficult to get one's head around concerning Corona has been the, the global nature of it. I mean, that this is everywhere. The pandemic is, is all over. I mean, I'm not, it, it's very, very difficult to, to grasp. But I think the Rework Center has been exceptionally well placed to investigate this as far as the impact on labor and work conditions is concerned. And the book on Corona, corona and work around the globe is an impressive uh, testimony to this, uh, which has been brought about incredibly fast and efficiently through the good work of Andreas and Fee and of the copy editor, Helen Feitz, who did a great job, and many other people, and of course, the enthusiasm and dedication of the more than 25 contributing authors. So the, the book is an impressive example of what rework can do and of the resources represented by the center and uh, something which we hope can be uh, further consolidated in, in years to come. So uh, the impact of the pandemic has highlighted the intensity of globalization, but also the inequalities it involves where modernization and backwardness go hand in hand and the riches and opportunity of some depend on the poverty of others and where the geography of exploitation is becoming more and more intricate and difficult to control and govern. The pandemic has exposed graphically the fragility of global governance institutions as illustrated in the field of health by the conflicts around the WHO. It has made governments retreat behind defense parameters of national protectionism as shown in Brexit and Trumpist wall, wall building. It has shown how increasing millions of people around the globe are, are not fully included within the boundaries of governance and do not have secure and guaranteed homes uh, they can return to and be registered at when quarantines, lockdowns and testing campaigns are decreed. Finally, efforts to control the pandemic have delineated a more principled battleground for competition between the respective possible reaches of democratic and authoritarian measures of intervention, with China, China aiming to showcase the superiority of authoritarian governance and the incompatibility of democracy with globalization. So these tensions within globalization have been prominent also at more micro national and local levels like Denmark and Scandinavia. And it's been very interesting and healthy for me to try to look towards uh, Denmark and, and, and sort of look at what's been happening here uh, locally. And I discuss in my chapter in the Corona and Workbook, uh, which is called Scares and Possibilities, some of these uh, uh, local uh, manifestations of globalization tensions. One initial scare was the possible spread of the pandemic into Denmark from butcheries in Germany, where Danish pigs were, were sent to be slaughtered by Polish, Romanian and Bulgarian workers contracted by labor agents and housed in con congested camps that offended Danish, including Danish trade union sensibilities. But it didn't take long for this initial scare to metamorphose as it became clear that some of the worst of the German butcheries were operated by a Danish firm called Danish Crown. Also Danish Crowns turn, turned out to have plants within Denmark itself where labor recruitment and accommodation were not too dissimilar and which also became hotspots for contamination during the first wave of the pandemic. I think during the second wave of the pandemic, if it makes sense to talk of waves and peaks at all, and if this is not more of a continuous sort of uh, flow of, of, of things, uh, but from October 2020 onwards, at least, I think when testing and tracing capacities were drastic, became drastically expanded in Denmark and border closures became a more long-term feature 
this particular scare has subsided somewhat. It may even be that some of the more regular forms of agent mediated and, and camp accommodated contract labor now belong to the groups of population that are more easy to test, trace and control, at least pandemically. On the other hand, other Danish forms of precarious have come to the form. Most recently, the drivers and delivery assistants of online, online uh, food, household and takeaway provisions brought to consumers landlocked at home or working for, and working from home. These are again nominally self-employed entrepreneurs in possession of their own bicycle, or they are employed by small and shady transport companies and not directly by the food, wine and consumer article businesses whose goods they uh, deliver, some of which are uh, owned by the most booming businesses uh, to prosper from pandemic uh, conditions. At the same time, the people working for them, or rather not working for them, uh, have conditions of work that are grueling, that are miserably paid, insecure, and involve very little uh, registration and paperwork. They are therefore also uh, often jobs available to the most vulnerable, including illegal non-Danish speaking immigrants and representing uh, an important trend in the direction of informalization of, of labor. So though uh, cracks um, uh, to talk about governance at, at the more local level, though cracks are now appearing in the handling of the corona pandemic challenge by the Danish minority social democratic government has so far overall been impressively successful, also compared to other Scandinavian countries, Sweden in particular. With the female prime minister, Meta Frederiksen, as its figurehead, and in spite of a number of individually not so brilliant ministers, the Social Democrats have managed to maintain since March 2020 a moderate form of health authoritarianism, which, is, has, which, is, which is, has been impossible for political opposition so far to unsettle. This has involved forms of co corporatism and state subsidies and intervention into the, the Danish economy through deficit, deficit financing to the tune of billions of euro that would have been considered totally irresponsible in the neoliberalist scenario, which were dominant until a few, year, few years ago. It has so far managed to limit the fall in annual Danish GNP through the pandemic to below 4%, which is quite an achievement in comparison with other Nordic countries. Importantly, it has also opened up possibilities for a rethinking and revival of Keynesianist policies that might offer important promises also in the field of other urgent areas of globalized concern like environmental degradation and climate collapse. But this social democratic success has come at the price of significant concessions to xenophobic populism winning back working class voters who had migrated from being social democrats to being supporters of the Danish People's Party or even more right-wing anti-immigrant representations. This has involved a high profile relaunch of the welfare state as a national social democratic agenda, giving priority to uh, uh, long serving Danish taxpayers and including strong anti-immigration narratives of the dangers of urban immigrant ghettos and of young immigrant thugs threatening peaceful Danes on public transport, especially at night. The idea of social contract giving given voice in social democratic discourse is thus one of inclusion and exclusion. And a response to this are the cracks now increasing in social discipline and subordination to health author authoritarianism. Such cracks are currently manifest in suburbs around Copenhagen with high percentages of immigrant population where corona incidents and hospitalization figures are very difficult to bring down to average. So the nationalist element in current Danish social democratism is also shown in the government's amb ambivalence vis-a-vis -vis the European Union where Danes have joined forces with Austrians, the Dutch and the Swedes in opposing budget increases and where the Danish 
prime minister also recently broke ranks together with the Austrians in the field of vaccine provision and traveling to Israel to uh, negotiate around joint vaccine production and giving Netanyahu's election campaign a major boost. Um, as all this uh, doesn't make much sense as the new Keynesianism promoted by the government would only, uh, you know, really uh, become uh, rational and be operational at full scale if it is implemented at a European level and not only at a national level. So it's usually uh, hard to see the reason of these Danish and Austrian solo flights of collaboration with Israel around the development of national lines of vaccine production against EU recommend recommendations. So this ambivalence of Danish social democratic EU policy is again a concession to right-wing nationalist populism within Denmark, which is in any case a losing, which is in any case losing steam as far as EU opposition is concerned. But I think that's, that's where I'll end because people are at this sort of, uh, uh, balance where, where the social democratic success of, of uh, confronting the uh, pandemic is, is being, uh, you know, undermined by uh, the, the contradictions involved in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Previn. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, maybe because time is already advanced, uh, if there are any questions, I saw two in the chat, I will briefly uh, uh, answer. I mean, I can't now read the table of content, uh, uh, but um, uh, what I can say is that there are roughly, I mean, a couple of themes. There's, uh, there are some chapters uh, on um, especially I mean, how, how um, Corona affected, for instance, um, informal workers, workers who depended very much on mobility and flexibility. Uh, there's another uh, set of papers on the so-called relevant uh, professions, uh, which are often then also those who are uh, uh, done by migrants and rather invisible. Uh, there's something uh, on health systems and how they uh, were able to uh, react to the virus. Youth, there are some chapters on youth uh, as also a group which seemed to be uh, uh, affected and, and, and butchered, where it was referring to it uh, uh, briefly. Uh, there's also um, a set of papers on um, the question of, of justice and democracy and how this is uh, under threat uh, in the context of, uh, of Corona. And finally, there are two chapters looking, taking a historical view to, um, to see how now a workplace uh, and home and house and household uh, are again um, uh, uh, kind of, of getting connected uh, closer. So I mean the, the, that I mean the whole issue about home offices and what does it mean also the workplace as a, as a side of sociability and other things. And we cover roughly 15 countries. I mean from Brazil, Argentina, United States, South Africa, Ethiopia, set of countries in West Africa, Israel, uh, India, France, Germany, um, and Denmark or um, the Scandinavian countries. So that's very briefly, but. Rabea has already put in a reference to the web page where you can see these details um, again before you order the book. And um, now maybe um, there are some questions. I think you can also talk to us. Uh, and I saw, of course, on the list of participants, uh, a number of former Rework fellows and friends. So hello to everyone. And you, of course, and also some contributors uh, to the volume. Uh, but of course, everyone is invited uh, to ask a question. Um, on which criteria uh, were the countries represented in the book chosen? Um, to be very honest, this was a rather deliberate choice. I mean, we have uh, former fellows from a number of places and we wrote to them. And the only thing we wanted to make sure is to have a certain set of uh, course, different world regions different topics, different localities, and also different themes. But there was not, I mean, we, we couldn't be comprehensive and we couldn't cover everything. The only thing we could do is to have a certain uh, variation uh, or array uh, of different places. Uh, and we made sure that at least most continents uh, have been 
have been covered in one way or the other. But but of course, this is not an encyclopedia, and and there was no way to to have a kind of complete mapping uh, of, of 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 Corona and work uh, in the globe or on the globe. So that, that were the kind of rough criteria we had. Um, but again, we didn't try to be comprehensive or complete or covering everything. So there's there are no more questions in the chat. Some very nice comments, but otherwise, yeah. no questions. Thank, Thank you. you for this. Huh. Oh, now we got one. Did different professions become highly charged icons of disagreement in different countries? Um, I mean, maybe I started, maybe Kremlin or Bridget or Fee have, have something to say. I mean, what was, of course, interesting, uh, um, uh, well, first of all, um, I mean, those uh, which, which are very, I mean, those who, who, who took uh, or, or occupy relevant or system relevant uh, professions, that was rather interesting. I mean, you could see, of course, the, the, the nurses uh, and, and medical staff, which was on the one hand very much celebrated. And I mean, I think in many countries you had this uh, seven o'clock or eight o'clock where everyone would go out and 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 and, and uh, applause, give some applause for them. But then when it came to to better working conditions and higher pay, uh, solidarity moved away rather quickly. And then there's another point which we do not really, I mean, tease out in the volume. But when I recently talked to another contributor, Mahuasaka, she 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 very much referred to the fact that many of these so-called system relevant uh, workers are also invisible workers and uh, 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 migrant workers and workers who don't like to see. And it's interesting, I mean, when I just remember in Germany that in the, the Corona period once, I mean, um, in the spring, when they needed someone or, or workers for the asparagus, which Germans like so much to eat, then it was suddenly uh, 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 very, uh, very easy uh, uh, to get them. So I think this is something uh, um, uh, where you can see uh, um, some, 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 some very regular features which you can find in nearly all continents or all regions we have uh, uh, in the book. But uh, maybe um, we have two more questions. Oh gosh. Does anyone else want to talk about that question? Because otherwise I'll just read them out aloud now. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, um, were there cases where the rights of organized labor and non-organized labor were not undermined during the pandemic? Not undermined, okay. Reverend Richard, you have a <laughs> But I think the effects have been very contradictory on, on, on different sectors of, of, of uh, the labor market. And, and, and in, in some ways in Denmark, I mean, formal unemployment has gone up uh, in very limited ways. I think it's a matter of 20,000 people or so that it, that has, it is. So, uh, but, but I think working conditions in many cases have, have been worsened because, I mean, I mean, employers have been able to impose uh, uh, labor conditions on, on, on workers that they would not otherwise uh, have accepted because of, of their uh, uh, fear of, of, of losing employment. And then I think the effects on, on the informal uh, labor market really needs to be investigated more because, you know, the effect of, of border closures have been that a lot of, of uh, in Denmark work that has been coming and going more or less regularly from, from Poland and from Germany and from, from Europe is now, you know, uh, from Sweden is, is subject to, to uh, border controls and, 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 current, and, and health uh, uh, isolation and stuff like that. But, and how that were, has worked out in uh, affecting labor flows, we don't really know. And that, that needs to be investigated. But, but I think a lot of, of the people who have been hit hard and who've been suffering from the crisis are these informal workers, you know, whose conditions have, have uh, uh, worsened uh, drastically. And, and that needs to be uh, researched more uh, closely. 
Um, yes, I, I can just add, I think similarly, I mean, it's not, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, I think the conditions of um, work have lessened, you know, and the pressures on workers um, to accept poor conditions have increased, of course, because there, you know, there have been, um, uh, you know, a tremendous um, increase in retrenchments, particularly around service jobs, finances, fi the finance sector has lo lost a lot of jobs in, in the lower level service jobs. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I think those, the conditions, the hours of work, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that unions, uh, you know, haven't been able to address because they're just trying to hold on to jobs. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, particularly about retailing jobs. Um, I, as well, I think the inf informal workers have been affected in South Africa. I mean, Deborah, you would know this, um, you know, the, in the initial stage of lockdown, you know, they weren't allowed, people weren't allowed to be out trading. If you were an informal trader, you weren't allowed to be operating. If you were um, a waste uh, reclaimer, you weren't allowed to be out operating even well. essential, other waste workers were defined as essential workers. Um, and there was, you know, quite a bit of organizing to push back to open up those spaces again and they, and they were uh, reclaimed. So, so, you know, reclaimers, you know, got the city to recognize, you know, in, in this, the various cities, but specifically in Johannesburg, where I am, got the city to recognize that their role, you know, was as essential as um, uh, employees of the, of the city and contracted employees of the city. Um, so, I mean, I think it is, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's the lessening of conditions against the threat of losing jobs or the actual loss of jobs that have most affected the unions. It's not um, necessarily so much a kind of... Um, you know, assault on the unions per se. It's the, which is again, part of my argument in my piece, which is a long time, you know, condition of the, you know, slow erosion um, of the conditions of work, um, you know, that are explained through precariousness um, and, you know, and the power of union, the declining power of unions, I think. Next question. Um, aside from the general rule that the pandemic revealed the weaknesses in every culture, nation and region, do the reports from all the contributors produce any general cases or surprising results? I know it, it's perhaps difficult to say because, uh, as Andreas said in his introduction, these are these are snapshots. I mean, they they are more sort of of, of uh, immediate uh, attempts to to diagnose situations rather than they are uh, examples of, of of thoroughgoing research. I think they are more. Uh, um, uh, pictures of situations which, which may, uh, as we're doing now, you know, indicate areas that would be served, uh, that we should prioritize for, for further investigation. Okay. Yeah, I, just to coming back to the, to the book itself, it is a panoptic, panopticon of uh, different cases and even though you have tendencies, um, there are also um, very specific um, observations to make. And um, one, maybe the most positive um, essay is about uh, a designer from Ethiopia, from uh, Addis Abeba, who uh, started to make, uh, to sew masks and uh, to extend her um, uh, profile. And, uh, but on the other hand, you have, it's not uh, unexpected practice, but an unexpected topic, like for example, from Israel, um, that the pilots of the um, Israeli airline are probably the only pilots having no problems um, caused by the pandemic because they, um, as a Israeli rule, have to be, um, uh, military uh, pilots before they start uh, flying on civilian flights. And so they are backed up by the military. And these are very unexpected um, uh, results you can find in this book, just two examples, if more. Um, next question. How do the different contributors assess the chances that the crisis will further feed into nationalism and populism? Uh, 
I mean, I mean, I mean, Richard, yes, please. I was just going to go quickly because I think probably um, Previn has more to say. I think I think it's absolutely um, uh, uh, you know e even in South Africa more on the table. It's funny. It's sort of like coronavirus has now become a background to economic crisis and then to whatever's happening there. So our you know it becomes one of the conditions that explains a grander economic crisis. And for South Africa. You know, we have, um, you know, there's been again, you know, these waves and increase, you know, increasing um, xenophobic violence or so attacks on uh, mostly other African immigrants in South Africa. There have been, you know, another another recent case of that um, in Durban. Um, and there is, I think, you know, definitely a mobilization of at least one of the factions within the ANC is using a kind of nativist. Um, nationalism, pop, nationalist populism, you know, to, 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 you know, to, to, to rest votes um, and to kind of keep their presence going. This is the faction that was connected to the former president, um, Jacob Zuma, you know, who, you know, went, we, who has, you know, various, him and his various um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, colleagues have been, um, you know, variously charged with um, corruption and what is, you know, ongoing as what's called state capture here. So, I mean, I think there's this kind of str political struggle and, you know, as the ANC's hegemony fragments, it's a very um, scary moment in the sense that that is this sort of nationalist populism does emerge and it's, and the economic crisis caused by everything before Corona and then Corona exacerbating it, I think is the kind of perfect terrain for, um, for this to emerge and, and become more dangerous in South Africa. But I think in, in Denmark, the picture is also contradictory because there is of course also voices and, and political uh, mobilizations that are critical of, of this national uh, nationalist populism. And, and I mean, there's the whole left which is becoming more uh, practically minded and more realistic and more influential and, and more uh, well articulated than it has been uh, for many years. And which is both, you know, but which is in a difficult position because it on the one hand doesn't want to to overthrow the social democratic government, but on the other hand, also uh, has to be be critical uh, of it. And also, of course, there's uh, there are very positive signs that that. Uh, you know, so that people are getting more engaged with, in the EU and supportive of the EU and, and, and seeing their political options for, or, uh, options for political action also as lying within the EU and that including left uh, parties. So, so the nationalist populism is not, is not standing on, on its own, but it's very strong within the uh, uh, very, very strong part of the social democratic uh, governance, which is uh, so uh, difficult to uh, challenge at the moment. And it's given voice also by uh, some of, uh, by, by trade unionists. I mean, one of, one of uh, Denmark has a, a minister for foreigners within the social democratic government who has come up in his career through the trade union movement and, and who is one of the main uh, articulators of this uh, uh, xenophobia, you know, and, 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 and so it's very, very worrying the, the way this is becoming sort of shamelessly uh, explicit in social democratic uh, discourse. And it's, it's very successful also in, in you know, uh, 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 winning voters from, from uh, uh, right-wing parties, you know, so, so uh, but but it does create uh, very, very bad schisms within society, and, and, and it, it does, I think it also uh, uh, supports a bifurcation of, of the labor market, where, where you get a sort of particular strand of, of, of labor being uh, reserved for, for people who are not fully included, and who are either uh, illegal immigrants or who are living on, on the fringes of, of uh, society. This kind of answered the next question uh, already, I think, um, which was for Prem uh, specifically, uh, the effect on the social contract and how much the social democrats have to give up. So I'll just jump to the next one because we've run out of time a little. Um, it's um, about the blurring of the differences between private and public spaces when it comes to schooling, homeschooling and homeworking. And um, does anyone have thoughts on what will come next or come out of this? What's the, the future of work kind of? 
easy. <laughs> I mean, I can quickly answer that. I think, yeah. uh, sorry, I keep interrupting you, Andre. No, no, go on, go on, go on, please. <laughs> um, no, I just quickly answer. I mean, I don't think, I think in schooling, a lot of the schools are back to some kind of hybrid, you know, more trying to do face-to-face -face still in the in our existing condition. I think, I think the big change we're going to see is in higher education. I think the universities are almost gleeful that we're able to use, use the technologies, not that the technologies are actually you know, useful um, or even working that well. But I do think we're going to see, and everybody is kind of acknowledging that some kind of form, you know, sort of a hybrid format of teaching, um, you know, is pretty much now, you know, has now been implemented. Um, and, and I think, um, I think in South Africa, that's obviously, you know, it, it exacerbates um, exclusions, um, uh, uh, you know, for all the reasons that I briefly spoke about earlier. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it actually will be a, 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 a site of struggle um, uh, for the future as well. I agree. And I think this is something which we will see. I mean, there is, uh, there will be strong negotiations and it depends very much also on the professions. I think, I mean, there is a certain danger that universities will be emptied of people and you just do a lot of remote stuff. Um, but uh, in, in, other, in other professions, it will be very difficult, um, I think, because you need people. And then also, uh, I think uh, bosses have to decide, I mean, where to better control people at, in their home office or, or inside and how to find a compromise. And I think also those who work have, have very mixed feelings about uh, the possibilities of home offices and and uh, the pitfalls of it. So I think, that, but this will be a, a discussion uh, where the outcome is, I think, rather unclear. And also depends very much on the regions you are looking at. I think uh, the issue of home offices in many countries, for most people, not really the, the most uh, burning question uh, when the future of their work is concerned. So we'll do two more questions and then wrap it up. Um, the first one is, um, were Corona measures, uh, in your opinion, used in authoritarian or more repressive contexts to oppress opposition? What do you think about that? Well, there have been, there have been very uh, clear cases, you know, of, of, uh, of new legislation being passed in <clears throat> in Denmark to allow uh, the government to intervene uh, uh, as in an emergency. So it's not been a declared emergency, but the laws have been introduced, which, for instance, introduce uh, uh, double up sentences for uh, uh, crimes that are Corona related. So if you if you steal uh, you know, disinfectant from a hospital uh, waiting room or something like that, uh, you, may, you will get a prison sentence, which is twice as high as uh, uh, what you would otherwise have gotten. There's a case going on at the moment where during a demonstration of, of an anti-government uh, movement called Men in Black, uh, people put a, a, a body size pup puppet uh, of uh, the prime minister uh, hang it uh, in, a, in a sort of gallow and, and put fire to it and, and placed a signpost next to it saying that uh, this uh, thing is a danger to society and must be exterminated. That, that was making reference to uh, statements uh, made by the government to justify the, uh, the killing off of all the, uh, the nets, uh, the minks in society to prevent uh, uh, contamination. But the woman who, who uh, and, and, and a woman who was speaking to that demonstration and pointing to these, uh, uh, this burning uh, effigy of the prime minister uh, was given a two, two year prison sentence in the magistrate's court. I mean, the, uh, that, that is, is now being appealed, but uh, she was um, given a sentence for incitement to violence uh, and disorder that would normally have been one year and which because of the emergency was was doubled to, to two years. So, so you could list uh, many examples, you know, of, of, of uh, uh, Corona legislation, which is limiting uh, democratic rights also uh, uh, and, and which is being uh, challenged and disputed in, in parliaments and, and courts. Uh, court. But that's a, a major issue, I think. 
I mean, just to add, I mean, India, for instance, uh, I mean, what also many of our Indian friends and colleagues are reporting has been a, a very sinister example of how an already very authoritarian, if not partly fascist government, was very increasing pressure uh, on, on the political opposition. So I think then and we have other cases also in, in Europe and in Africa uh, where rulers really tried out new measures in order to keep under the, the umbrella of anti-corona measures to keep the opposition uh, at bay. So last question for today. Did any of the authors highlight the voice and experience of essential workers? Simple answer is yes, um, uh, in, in, in a number in a number of ways. And um, I mean, one example. I mean, there, there are chapters, for instance. I mean, about about teachers in Wales. And of course, teachers are also, and 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 and, and uh, Britain and others have referred to it, have been declared. I mean, essential uh, for the system. We have um, chapters on 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 nurses, where, where nurses speak, but also on informal workers uh, in Kolkata and other parts of India. Uh, so yes, I mean, we very, I mean, authors very carefully also try to uh, uh, give voices or at least try to capture voices of those who are considered as essential workers. And and as I earlier said, I mean, it became very obvious that these essential workers are also often those who are um, rather invisible and 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 often in a migrant situation uh, and so on and so forth and do not belong to this new nationality that, as Preben has described for Denmark, is becoming so important uh, in, in, many, in many contexts and many places. Preben, you have to unmute yourself. Preben, Preben, you have to unmute. Yeah. I was just happy to have this question from Mercedes Van Gogh, who's a, a Kenyan uh, friend and colleague of, of mine and who herself has a, a background in, in nursing before she became a, a, an academic and a PhD studying masculinity and AIDS in Kenya. You know, So there's a very nice uh, a chapter in the book, Mercedes, on, on nurses, which you will enjoy. Yeah. It, it's it's not matching the question precisely, but it, uh, I I really would like also to mention those articles, essays in the book, speaking about people for whom nothing has changed. They are really they live at the margins of society. They are really um, in very precarious situations and. For them, the effect of the pandemic is almost like nothing. They, for them, it does not change. Great. Okay, at this point, I think we, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we answered almost, you answered almost every question. Um, thank you so much for doing this, for talking about the book. Thank you so much for all uh, participants to, who are still here. Lots of you have left, but thank you for being here. Um, as I said, this was all recorded and it's too late now. You're all on record. You'll be on YouTube tomorrow and everyone who participated will get the link and then share it on a global level. Um, so yeah, thank you very much and have a great rest of the evening, rest of the day, wherever you are. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.